Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Hey, Pastor Josh did such a great week last week presenting. I love sitting under his ministry and listening to him. His approach to theology and scripture is a little bit different than mine, so it's refreshing to me to see someone who studies and looks at scripture a little bit different. And we also had another amazing Wednesday night Bible study. If you ever have a, if you ever have a Wednesday night off that you want to come sit through it, come on in, check it out. Um, it is really good how we study and how we're able to talk about those topics throughout the night. We are in a series, actually we're wrapping up a series today called How to Read Your Bible. And again, this has not been a technical series on like how to highlight and underline and take notes. It is how to understand scripture, how to read it in context, how to understand Old Testament versus New Testament. And in fact, I've really enjoyed it and it's kind of piggybacking off of what we're doing on Wednesday nights. Next week, Pastor Josh is going to kick off a series called Shape Up. It's going to talk about spiritual formation, spiritual habits, how to have a consistent walk with the Lord. And so today, I want to give you a new Bible verse or a, a passage, and it's going to be our key text for today, and it's found in Hebrews 4.12, and it says this. Maybe you've heard it before. For the word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account." And man, it kind of ends heavy there, huh, right? Like, oh, Lord, I got to give an account for everything I did in my life. Well, we're going to dissect this. We're going to dive into this passage. But before we do, let's pray. Father, we thank you as we get into your word that, Holy Spirit, you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so how do you guys feel about these self-driving cars? Mercedes-Benz is coming out with one, I just heard. Tesla's been doing it, right? These self-driving cars, I mean, just think about it. Maybe you've never been in one before, but you can either type in a location or speak the location. The computer gets it. And I mean, you could just sit back, relax, take a nap if you wanted to. Huh? Has a little shocker in the seat that wakes you up just in case you... No, just kidding, it doesn't. I mean, are you cool with it? Does it scare you? Like, are we wondered, like, do we, do we worry about, like, is somebody going to hijack the computer system and, like, override it? Could there be, like, a virus? That, nobody? Yes? No? Yeah, we're, we're kind of divided. Like, it's a cool idea, but at the same time, like, I had, like, self-parking on my car, and I'm too much a control freak to let it self-park itself. Like, I was like, nope, I'm not doing it. I know how to parallel park. Right, because I don't know, like what if a sensor's off and all of a sudden, man, I scratch my car or smack the curb or something with my rims. Oh, gosh, I hate, anyway, let me stop. <laughs> if you ever get the opportunity to be in one of these things, it appears to those around you, if you passed another driver, unless they are completely knocked unconscious, if you looked at them, you would assume that they are driving the vehicle because they're behind the wheel and they're in the seat, but the vehicle is driving itself. And I just want to pose this idea that the same is true when we study the Bible. It may seem like we are the subject, or we're the agent, or we're the important thing, but God really is. We may think that we're in charge of I can only read the scriptures that I can understand. But actually, God is in charge of revealing scripture to you. Scripture is so alive that although it was written on paper thousands of years ago, it applies to current situations today in our lives. It is self-driving. It is alive. It is, it, it's not changing, but it is ever adapting 
to situations and understandings in our lives. I believe that the Bible is just as relevant today as it was when it was written. Now, in context of that, I think we have to draw some of our own understandings. If Jesus came riding in on a donkey in the Bible, he wouldn't ride in on a donkey today, let's just say. He may ride in on a Mustang. Ford Mustang car? No, didn't get the pun there, okay. Right, he's gonna be in a vehicle or something. He, he may take an airplane to get somewhere, I don't know. But like, so when we read scripture, we have to understand, yes, times have changed. Like, they didn't have computers. They didn't have live streaming on the internet. You know what I'm saying? There were things that are a little bit different, but the crux and the ideas behind it are alive and ever adaptive to where we are. So we need to understand that when we interact with the text, the Spirit speaks fresh and new revelation to us. It is truly remarkable and even miraculous. On Wednesday night, we took a little bit of time to do a spiritual practice called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina basically is taking the scripture and reading it over and over multiple times, putting an emphasis on different words. And when you do that, it literally changes the subject matter. It changes what that scripture is saying to you each time. But it's one passage. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. The subject matter there is love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. For God so loved the world, he gave. He's a giver. He's not a withholder, right? So each time we say it, it's fresh and new and means something different. So as we read scripture, even passages that we've read a hundred times, the spirit specifically speaks new and loving things. And this is like a two-edged sword, it speaks this two-edged sword. It can cut both ways. It can give us different ideas. It speaks to us in the present context and in its original context, which I think is amazing. With this in mind, we should never grow weary reading scripture, even texts that we're extremely familiar with because it seems redundant. I know there's this struggle sometimes we're reading the Bible, like, ah, I've already read this, so we skip down to an area that we haven't read before. But the Bible has power to speak fresh words in every season of our lives. And such is the case with the passage that we're gonna look at today. I think if you've been in church any length of time, you've probably heard Hebrews 4.12. And it's continually, let's take a look at it, all right? Let's look at it again. Let's break this down for a second. Hebrews 4.12. I know where I'm going with this, and I was just about to jump ahead, and I can't. All right. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is, say it with me, alive and active, right? So the scripture is alive and active. It is sharper than any two-edged or double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of the, say it, soul and you know, and there's, a, there's like a hard thing too, right? When we think we heard from God or we read a scripture, did I understand it in my intellect or did my spirit reveal that to me? When I think God says something to me, did I hear that in my intellect? Did I just think that up? Is this what I want God to say? Or did my spirit really get a message from heaven and God speak to me? Well, this says the only thing that can discern that is the word of God. The word of God is the only thing that can tell you whether this was a thought or by the spirit. Come on. It splits even joints and marrow. It is a judge of the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him who must give an account. So here's what I want to say is that scripture is continually working through our lives. It, the spirit is continually working through scripture over and over. It never ends. It's a continuous ongoing text of the Holy Spirit's job. And so this is what the 
author of Hebrews means when he says that the Bible is living and active or alive and powerful or alive and active, however you want to look at it, is that the Holy Spirit is constantly working. The Holy Spirit just didn't simply inspire the writers of the Bible, but the Holy Spirit continues to inspire the readers of the Bible. Here's another two-edged sword. The Holy Spirit didn't only instruct the writer, but the Holy Spirit is also revealing to you a double-edged sword. When the word goes forth from God's mouth, it did both things. It inspired a writer and revealed to the reader. Come on, man, that's powerful. That's powerful. Alive and active, always speaking. I believe that the words that God spoke have never stopped moving. It's alive and active. He spoke it, and it's continually working. It's a lot like light. He spoke light, and that light never stopped moving. We actually determine everything that we know about time based on light. The speed of light gives us what we know as time. Scripture is not static and lifeless, but forever imbued and permeated with the spirit of God. The spirit of life who raised Christ from the dead, the Bible says, now lives in you and me. So the spirit not only was at work at the word coming forth, but the spirit is also at work in you revealing scripture. He speaks to our spirits and ministers through our lives. For this reason, we should approach scripture with expectation. And I think the reason why a lot of people don't get much out of devotion time and Bible reading is because they approach scripture with the expectation that they're not going to understand it. I'm doing it because, you know, I signed up to do this 21-day fast and, like, I signed up to do, like, a Bible reading plan with my friends and so I'm just going to do it, but I don't normally get much out of it. And so when we approach it with that expectation, hey, guess what? The Bible says, too, be it unto you according to your faith. But when I approach scripture with an expectation for it to speak to me, be it unto you according to your faith. Right? How are you approaching the scripture? Ask the Holy Spirit. I do it every single time I preach. I ask the Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding. Enlighten us to your truth. Show us things to come. I pray that prayer every time I sit down to study and read and meditate. Open my eyes. Let me see something new and living and fresh. And the more we read the Bible, the more we will, be, we will find that we are not the primary drivers of Scripture. The more we read Scripture, the more we realize that it is the Holy Spirit who is at work. He is driving the vehicle. I'm just kind of sitting back and giving the instruction, kind of say like, what's the destination? Here's what we're going to read today. Right? You're in control of that. You can decide to read Old Testament or New Testament. Where am I going to read today? What's my devotional? But once you put that location in the GPS, it's kind of hands off. That scripture begins to speak. And as we take action to read scripture, we may come to find that God is the one acting on our behalf and revealing his word to us. So I want to talk about this passage the word of God is alive and powerful. And here's the, t- the tool that I want to give you when you're studying scripture. There's a temptation when studying passages to zoom too far into a verse that you lose the context. Has anybody been in science class and used a microscope? And what the microscope does, right, it has multiple lenses or you can control how, what the zoom point is or the focal point is. And so you zoom in so that you can get greater detail, right? And so what happens sometimes when you zoom way, way, way into a scripture to get deeper detail as to what a specific word means or a sentence means or an idea means, sometimes you forget that it's in a bigger story, it's in a bigger context. And a lot of people do that with this passage. I was doing it with this passage. 
I, got, I was going so deep just on a two-edged sword. We began to do research on, you know, what's the purpose of a two-edged sword and, and who's the sword makers and, and all of like this cool different stuff. And I was like, wait a second, I'm losing. Why is this passage here? Why do faith preachers zoom so far in on this passage? And, and you know, because I think it has some elements that are like, Really cool for the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the two edged sword, dividing into the soul and spirit, joint and marrow, a judge of the thoughts and tensions of your heart, so the word of God knows what's in your heart. And that's like, well, everything's gonna be laid before the Lord. Right? And so that we it'll be uncovered before him who you're gonna give an account. Whatever is hidden will be manifested. So if you have any secrets in your life, just know you didn't hide them from God. And like, we lose the context. Here's another tool. Can you guys put the verse up on the screen? Hebrews 4.12. What's the very first word of this sentence? Four. Okay. So anytime a passage or a sentence starts with for or therefore, we need to find what it's there for. You get what I'm saying? So what this idea is saying is, based upon the information I have just presented to you, I now want to present another idea, right? Based on the information I just presented, therefore, I want to present a new idea. So we have to understand what the context is. What is this saying? And the verse, the passage right before, and this, this sends you down a rabbit track if you want to study we have to go back to the next full idea above this, Hebrews 4, 8 through 10. It says, for, <laughs> we got to go even further back, but whatever. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not have spoken later about another day of rest. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now watch this, because this is the verse right before it. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Now, just, let's just chew on that for a minute. Because then it goes, for the word of God is alive and powerful. If we look at for in Hebrews 4, 8, then we go back to the next idea, and then the next idea, and the next idea. The entire context, just leave that up for a minute. The entire context of Hebrews 4.12, or telling us that the word of God is alive and powerful, and is a discerner of your heart, all revolves around Sabbath rest. That's the context. It's talking about rest. Resting from works. But this is a very key scripture right here, and I want to explain it to you. He says this, verse 10. For anyone who enters God's rest also rest from their works. What was happening in this time is that everybody was so fixated, so zoomed into what does it mean to rest? Okay, so now we make rules. We can't work, we can't turn lights on, we can't even use toilet paper properly, we gotta rip the toilet paper up and have it ready because we can't tear paper. Come on, somebody. They went so far in to what does it mean to rest from the works. And he's saying here is, the point wasn't to rest from works. The point was to rest in God. We're supposed to rest in God. And he says this, look what it says. If you rest in God, it is accounted unto you to, that you rested from works. This was, I mean, am I reading this wrong? For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. Resting in God is a rest from the works. But we get so fixated and we split churches. Chick-fil-A needs to be closed on Sundays. <laughs> Gotta rest from our works. And we missed the point God technically wasn't resting from his works because it tired him not to bring about creation. He rested within himself. 
He rested within his union. He rested within relationship. And by doing so was fulfilled. Jesus is out performing miracles, which technically is works, right? He's performing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And his disciples come to him and said, Jesus, you need a break, bro. Like your sugar level's got to be dropping. We need to get you like a bagel or something. A slice of pizza at least. And he says, no, I'm good. I've already ate. And they start fighting. Who fed him? Who did that? Who fed him? It was my job. I was on the hospitality team to give him food. Who did that? And he's like, yo, doing the will of my father is my nourishment. Although I'm performing works, I'm at rest because I'm in him. I'm rested in the father. It's alive and powerful. And when we take this passage out of context, right? So it's saying that it's, it, it's the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of your heart. What thoughts and intentions of the heart? Right? Because we want to take this passage and make it everything. But in context, it's saying that this is a discerner of your thoughts and intentions of your heart. Whether God honors you because of your works or because of him. That's the intentions. Why am I doing what I think I need to do for God? Do I think that I have to rest from my works and that's the only way that God loves me and cares for him and wants to be with me? Or is he calling me to rest in him? Right, because it can become kind of braggadocious when it's about works. Look at all I've done. We got into some of those debates on Wednesday night about looking at other people and saying, well, how could they possibly go to heaven with all these things that they're doing? Look what I've had to sacrifice. Well, then it's coming about your works and your ability to be a good person for God to love you and honor you. It's so easy to be on the other side of judging someone who sins differently than you, but by the very fact that you're judging them for their sin, you're sinning. Right, it's the craziest paradigm of everything. Like, what, how are we looking at this? The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of your heart. Because if you really cared about that person who was living a lifestyle contrary to what you believe the word of God was, you wouldn't sit back in judgment and say, they don't get to go to heaven. You'd say, how can I help them see truth? That's the real, that should be the hard intention. How can I be part of their life to lead them to godliness? How can I help them and lead them to holiness? The intention of your heart. So like I said, if you see a verse that starts with four, we gotta know the context. But I do wanna zoom in for a moment on these two words. It says that it divides even the soul and spirit, dividing even the soul and spirit. This living word of God is the only thing in all creation that divides soul and spirit or knows whether something was a thought or if something came to you by the spirit. And I, I, I do love being judgmental about that kind of stuff. I'll be honest. I get very judgmental when people say, God said... Now my ears peak up. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram watching people preach. And "And God said to me this morning. And then my ears peak up. Because I want to know if God's saying to you the same thing he's saying to me. And I want to see if what God said to you and what God said to me aligns up with scripture. Right? Because the moment someone says God said and God didn't say it, that's using the Lord's name in vain. Not saying his name with a cuss word, which I don't recommend doing, but that's not using the Lord's name in vain. Using the Lord's name in vain is saying God said something God didn't say, and it becomes very manipulative. Because we're using the name of God to bring credibility to what we're about to preach. That's dangerous. It's dangerous. So let's look at this. He says that the word of God is the thing that discerns or divides between soul and spirit. The word soul is the Greek word 5590, which is called 
Say it like this, suke. Try it with me, suke. Or where we get the word psyche or psychology. It's the seat of the feelings and desires and affections, aversions, our heart or our soul, our reasoning faculties, our mind. Mind, will, and emotions kind of go into this soul. Mind, will, and emotions. And then the word for spirit here is the Greek word 4151, which is said pneuma. Pneuma, say pneuma. It means properly spirit, wind, or breath. So we know whether something is the breath of God, the logos, the spoken word of God to us, or if it was just an idea by finding scripture by finding scripture. If you get an idea that comes to your mind, well, God just said this to me, and it's contrary to God's word, think again. Think again. Because you might be hearing a wrong voice, or you're just making some stuff up. The Bible is very clear, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Where? Where is he going to direct your path to? For thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So the path that he's going to lead you down is the word of God. The word of God, it all points back to him. You're not driving this car. You're not driving this car. Every destination you could put into your auto Bible reading is going to point back to God. He is the subject matter. He is the subject matter. Let's take a look at this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. This starts with a huge word, trust. Trust. Because if I don't trust God's character, if I believe that God is an angry God holding me over a fire of punishment, man, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I don't trust anger. Anger is irrational. Anger doesn't make any sense. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Now, if you really want to study this one out, this one's going to freak your head out because it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, which is your mind, your mind, will, and emotions, the soul, and then lean not to your own intellect. So trust God with your intellect, but don't trust your intellect. Why would he say something like this? Why would he say something like this? It's so confusing. It's so like using the same words. And Okay. How is God going to speak to you? He's going to speak to your spirit. But your spirit must go through the filter of your reasoning faculties. Your spirit must speak through your mind. It's the only way you understand it. It's how he, we bring the divine things to the natural things. It does have to be processed. So he's basically telling you, we got to get the filter right. We got to get the filter right. We have to trust that what we hear from God is good. If it doesn't start there, if we don't trust that all good and perfect gifts come from God and that God is good and that there's no evil to be had against us, then our own understanding is going to lead us astray. We have to trust in the Lord. Positive change and personal growth are only possible if we're open to the leading of the Word of God. On Wednesday nights, uh, it, it can kind of get tense sometimes when we have a debate or discussion because all of us are coming to this table with some level of pre-programming from another church or someone we listen to online or reading a Bible verse and understanding it for ourselves, And then we may teach something that is totally contrary to what you've ever been taught and it's like, no, you're a liar, you're wrong. And maybe not. 
And I'm not calling you wrong or where you came from wrong. I'm just saying maybe there's some new information that we've learned. Maybe there's some new revelation about scripture that we've come to. But watch this, here's a, here's a challenge when you think that you know what the Bible says. Hebrews 5.11, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. You no longer try to understand. You think you know it. You either think you know it or you gave up trying. One or the other is saying here, I have so, this is in context to, I had to give you milk, but you wanted meat. I got so much I want to teach. I want to give you meat, but just stop trying to understand. So you be very careful to getting into that mode on either side. You think you know it all, so no one can tell you anything or you think you don't know anything and you can never understand it, so you stop. Saying both are a dangerous place. There's so much that the scripture wants to share with you. We have to be open to that destination and not get stuck on it. Not getting stuck on that destination. Let the auto drive take you where it's leading you. Sometimes I rabbit track down all things by looking up, when you're reading your Bible, you can see like, if you're doing it on the Bible app, maybe like a button that has like an A, B, C, or D, or a one, two, or three, or sometimes it's like a bubble. And sometimes I'll get lost for hours just clicking on all those bubbles and uh, cross-referencing other parts in the Bible where they're going. And I'm not really driving that. Either the commentary is, or someone else who's studied this, or even God himself is leading this interaction of scripture taking me to the destination that always points back to him. One of the main roles of the Holy Spirit is to lead and guide us and to judge the thoughts and intentions of our heart. The thoughts and intentions. Why are you doing what you're doing? And this is all this passage is kind of saying is, why are you resting from works the way that you're resting? What is your intentions? What is your thoughts? Are we bringing an offering of rest to God out of a pure heart and a pure intentions or are we doing it to just meet the standard? Are we doing it out of obligation? Am I doing it because I'm afraid? Am I doing it just so that I can get a blessing from God? Or am I presenting my life a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God because I love him, because I want to honor him with no other strings attached. If we are not open to the guiding power of the Holy Spirit, then the Bible kind of loses its transformative potency in our lives. It becomes just like another book if we let it. If we stop trying to understand, then it is just some other book. So I say, before you get into reading or before you ever try to read your Bible, pray, Holy Spirit, open the eyes of my understanding. Enlighten me to your truth. Show me things to come. And be okay with where it goes. Now what's gonna happen is you're gonna read something and your own intellect is gonna have an idea. It's gonna be like, but wait a second. And then you're going to be like, you know, tempted to like create your own kind of cult on one idea. <laughs> it happens. It's how they start. One scripture out of context. Okay, then, then use this. Out of two, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every truth be established. Can I find another scripture that says the same thing? Can I back it up? Can I prove my point by finding other scriptures? And I love when I get into a debate and someone's kind of got me and I'm like, I don't know how to prove my point. Guess what? Your boy gonna go study. Your boy gonna go look it up. I get obsessed with finding the answer to kind of prove what my idea is out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. I wanna find two, three, four verses to back that up. Then I have a, right, it's the discerner. It tells me whether what I just looked up was out of my soul, out of my mind, or whether this was a revelation by the Spirit of God. Let's pray today. Father, we thank you 
for your time that we could spend in your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that as we do study scripture, we don't get lost and hung up, zooming too far in, that we lose the context of what you're trying to say to us. Help us to study to show ourselves approved, that we understand scripture, that we can share our faith with others. But Holy Spirit, we kind of take our hands off the wheel a little bit. We ask you to lead us, guide us, direct us into all truth. Show us the things that you want to speak to us in our lives. Show us how to be the best version of ourselves, that that light shines to others. Help us to stop trying to fix others and change others. Let us be an example unto them. And by doing so, it lifts you up. And you said, if we lifted you up, you would draw all men unto you. So we thank you, Lord, for doing that work, drawing men, knocking on the doors of our hearts, calling us to be with you. As we leave here today, Lord, I thank you for your protection, your safety, and wisdom. Give us the wisdom to drive slowly when it's slippery. Even though we got four-wheel drive, help us to have wisdom Lord, as we drive home today, protect us and keep us safe. Let the word that was planted be in good ground today, reaping a harvest in due season. Bless the works of our hands that everything we set them to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Love you. Have a great weekend. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.